If you're an author or plan to be one, get excited because this podcast is for you. Book Marketing Mentors is the only podcast dedicated to helping you successfully market and sell your book. If you're ready for empowering conversations with successful marketing mavens, then grab a coffee or tea and listen in to your host, international best-selling author, Susan Friedman. Welcome to Book Marketing Mentors, the weekly podcast where you learn proven strategies, tools, ideas, and tips from the masters. Every week, I introduce you to a marketing master who will share their expertise to help you market and sell more books. Today, my special guest is Ben Joya. He's a three-time best-selling author and publisher who makes it easy to write a world-class book in just five weeks and then launch, position, profit, and make a difference. With 35 years of writing and publishing, Ben has produced more than 352 million magazines. His teachings are used by more than 40,000 people worldwide. Wow, those numbers are pretty mind-boggling. Ben helped a Fortune 100 company shift culture by creating an empathy video game for employees with MIT. He trained leaders at Stanford and created the first mindfulness program for the ALS Association. That's for the Lou Gehrig's disease. Ben believes that people thrive when they relax, smile, and quit suffering now. Ben, what an absolute pleasure it is to welcome you to the show. And thank you for being this week's guest expert and mentor. Oh, Susan, you're most welcome. And thank you so much for having me here. I am so excited to chat with you today. Well, Ben, I know that one of your areas of expertise is, in fact, storytelling, which we didn't even talk about in your bio, (laughs) other than those mind boggling numbers. I'm like, oh, my goodness, even (laughs) saying them was a mouthful. Over the five years that we've been doing this podcast, we've had many people talking about storytelling. However, I know what's different about you and your approach to storytelling is that it's storytelling for experts. Mm. And I really love us to focus on that side of storytelling in our conversation together. But let's sort of make sure that we're all on the same page and start up by understanding, first of all, why stories and storytelling is just so important for our listeners. Absolutely. Susan, thank you so much, Ray, because we got to start at the beginning of the story. Yeah, think about stories and you think about human communication. It is the oldest way we have been communicating. So before cave paintings, people were around the fire, sharing stories with each other, communicating, you know, sharing mythology, communicating among tribes, like the whole thing. I mean, human civilization is based in story, right? And our experience of the world is based in story because it is in our bones, in our blood, in our DNA. First and foremost, that's a tremendously important reason why it's so important. And then why it's so important in our business as well is because people like you, people like me, people like our listeners here today, teach a lot of stuff, have a lot of wisdom, have a lot of expertise and if you deliver that wisdom and expertise and with a whole bunch of information and no stories, no transformation is going to happen, right? People need that balance of story and information, right? Story and fact to literally harmonize both hemispheres of their brains to ground each side of the equation, right? The story needs the fact to give it grounding on the earth, right? And the facts need the stories to give it wings and, you know, its ability to inspire and transform. I love that. I really love that explanation because you're right. I mean, learning a fact is one thing and remembering it is something else, but having a story around that fact, people will remember the story and hopefully then obviously the fact that goes along with it. And I've learned that over the years because I'm a high content presenter and it's the 10 ways to do this and the five ways to do that. And I'm learning that I need to do fewer and incorporate those stories or little vignettes because I don't always have time for a full story, but a vignette that uh, helps make the point. 
Now, we talked about in the beginning the fact that experts, the idea of storytelling for experts, and as you know, I work with nonfiction authors to help them go from uh, unknown author to author authority. Mm -hmm. Now, talk to us about the idea of using stories to help build that authority, that credibility in the marketplace. Absolutely. Thank you, Susan. So there's a, a few layers of that. The thoughts are bubbling and I want to talk about 14 of them and I'll try to keep it to three. <laughs> One of my first coaches, although the expression may sound a little crude, kept saying facts tell and emotions sell. When you want to inspire people to action, whether it's clicking like on your Facebook page, opening your email, saying yes to your high ticket offer, whatever that kind of thing is, they're not just going to say yes because you've presented a whole bunch of facts. They're going to say yes because you've helped them see a vision of themselves and their success through working with you, being around you, being part of your process so that you have essentially helped them reshape their story right in their eyes. And you have also the opportunity as you're doing that to share your story. So the reader, listener, client, prospect, whomever it is, really has that opportunity, like I said before, not only to see this real vision of themselves for the future, but also to be able to see themselves in you and know you and like you and trust you because you've help them connect with their story and ostensibly shared your story with them. And that's so important. More and more, we're learning that we need to tell our story and even companies are telling their story yep. because it helps to, as you say, the emotion, it helps to sell because people like to relate to that. Mm -hmm. So yes, I really like that. Facts tell, emotions sell. Mm -hmm. I'm going to remember that one. Now, do you have a particular formula that you use to help your clients tell stories? I do. This is based on a communication framework that is originally credited to someone named David Kolb at Harvard. And then um, I learned it from some you know, marketing mentors. I'm not sure if they're still around doing stuff, but uh, someone named Eben Pagan I don't know if you've ever come across him or Lou Gallo. I have, yeah. Okay, yep. So this is what I learned from them originally. Essentially that framework of why, what, how, and what if. So helping the person understand like why the story that you're about to tell them is important and resonant in their life. And then giving them the story and any appropriate information, context, you know, hearsay, all of the kind of stuff. And then to give some kind of a call to action or, you know, a little bit of a how-to. And even if it's just something as simple as turn the page to find out more, or the first step is becoming aware of when you get angry, like whatever that thing is. And then the last step of that sequence, the what if is helping the person imagine, you know, integrating that belief or perspective or thought or behavior into their business or life to have this transformed, elevated experience in their future. So that's one way I do it. And the other way I do it is the same framework, but invite my client to drop us right into the middle of a story at the beginning of that sequence that I just described. Now, do you encourage your clients to make a log of different stories? I mean, Every day there's something going on, even though you don't think of it necessarily in a story, but you could create a story about everything you do. Indeed. Do you have them make a log or something? How do they remember all these stories? Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's a, a few approaches. You know, there's the writing stories that one remembers throughout one's life, whether it's year by year or zero to three years, three to six, whatever will... Uh, some people get scared of the year to year. So if you, you know, even smaller increments just to get the ball rolling, because once you start unleashing the stories, so many more of them become available and relevant very, very quickly. So yes to Susan to activities like, you know, going back through life, but for me, not, but, and for me, I will often help my clients or guide my clients in making the connection among who's your audience? How do you serve them? 
How do they talk about their stuff, right? Their pains and challenges and goals and dreams. And then what are the stories in your professional and or personal life that are resonant and relevant in that kind of um, cluster of thought right there? For many years, Ben, I said, I don't have any stories. It took me a long time to realize that I have so many stories. I mean, I could write a book about all the stories that I have. Now that I realize that I have stories, I'm sure you've heard that a few times that people come and say, I yep. don't have any stories. How do you convince them that they do? Yeah, I try not to convince, right, but more help them see for themselves that they do. I mean, sometimes I have to just say, hey, look, buddy. But in general, I, I try to lead the witness. <laughs> and I do it in, you know, in such a way that some of it is through the actual activity that I just described. But the kind of the primary method for me is I do an exercise with my clients where they face something. It might be called terrible. It might be called terrorizing, whatever that thing is. And then right from that right w-r-i-t-e right from that place and very often from that place comes a lot of clarity around why the heck they're here doing what they're doing then that unlocks the oh these are the kind of stories and circumstances and situations that i remember from my life and my experience and my first foray into entrepreneurship or whatever it is basically the flood becomes unleashed the more clear and aligned people get with why they're here in my experience. And I try to facilitate that in the work that I'm doing with them. Yeah. Jolting your memory. You're absolutely right. Because there's certain things that you say. And just recently, in fact, this week I talked about, I tried a product. I always love trying when you have a, a shower or you're in somebody else's place and I love to use one of the products that they have. And I happened to be at my daughter's taking a shower and she had some oil that she uses mm -hmm. on her body or whatever. Any event, it says you could put some on your scalp. So I put some in my scalp after I'd washed my hair. I couldn't get it. Out. <laughs> <laughs> and I was telling my hairdresser this and she said, oh my goodness, that reminds me of when I did something similar when I was a teenager and my mother couldn't get this stuff out of my hair. Mm. And so just me telling my story jolted her memory to tell me her story, which had sort of some similarities to it. I was just like, yes, that flood of memory. Maybe it's a smell. Maybe it's the sight of something that jolts that memory. I appreciate you saying that, Susan, very much, because I have a, a story that I love to share of being on a bus in San Francisco. I live in San Francisco and was on the bus several years ago, and we're busy rush hour time. We're stopped at a busy intersection, and people are crossing at the crosswalk, and there's a gentleman crossing in the crosswalk, walking his dog, who's a German shepherd, right? So it's not a little dog, walking his dog, and the dog is off the leash during rush hour in the city. I am standing there looking and I'm feeling uncomfortable, like nervous, a little bit scared, the whole deal, because I have had experience in my life throughout the years of living in cities, unfortunately, pets running out the door and getting hit and killed by cars. That's happened a few times in my life and that's not uncommon in city contexts, right? So I'm looking at that and I said to the bus driver, because I was right up front, full bus of people, I turned to the bus driver and said, wow. That really scares me, you know, that guy walking the dog like that for my reasons. And I didn't say them out loud. And the bus driver said, Yeah, me too. That's a wild animal. Right. So a completely different story and reason and perspective and history, et cetera, on the same kind of thing. Susan, what you were saying before, the stories mirroring and triggering and inspiring and instigating each other and also the reminder and the recognition that even in and around what may appear to be the same story to two different people can be two different entire universes. Very much so. Yes. When you work with your clients, your authors, you're going through your program where you teach them how to write their book, you make it easy for them. Is there a certain percentage of the book 
as a minimum that you encourage them to have stories in that book? That's a great question. It's not so much percentage. It's more that if the story or because the stories are operating as harmonizing factors for the facts and information that are going on throughout the book, that I teach more of the cadence around kind of balancing from one to the other versus this kind of percentage. But I do make sure that in each section of each book and in each chapter, that there is at least one story. And especially in the chapters, meaning the body chapters, kind of the meat and potatoes of the book, that there's at least one case study in each of those chapters as well. Because case studies, right, are stories unto themselves. Talk to us more about that, because I imagine that that fits in really well with the idea of being a thought leader, Mm -hmm. that you're presenting case studies. But when I think of case studies, sometimes I think of them being sort of full of numbers and dry and not very exciting. Talk to us about how you present a case study. I follow my framework that I described earlier, where I, at the beginning, I'm describing, sharing with the reader why it's important for that person to not only pay attention and read the case study, but why the what I'm about to talk about is relevant, whether it's relevant to the chapter, the book, the bigger message throughout the book, whatever that thing is. And then in the second step, the what, that's where I talk about the case study kind of things, but put it in the context of story. A boutique design company in San Francisco wanted to stop serving corporate clients and work with clients who were doing good for the world. So I helped this boutique agency basically shift around their marketing and change their approach to start working with sustainable organizations. And as a result, this result happened, this result happened, this result happened, and this person is much happier and now has time to also do volunteer projects and the things that he loves to do. So I just kind of told the story, but that's my case study right there. I was like, oh, that that sounds like an interesting thing versus like, oh, here's like a, a slog of data. Yeah, I think the whole idea of case studies as you're referring to it takes on just a whole different element than, as I said, what my interpretation of that word means, you know, facts and figures and some kind of analysis. But I like it if you talk about it as a story. Yeah, I suppose a case study is a story. Yeah, It's just about one particular company or one particular incident. Exactly that. And coming back to the notion of storytelling for experts, sometimes more than sometimes, you know, folks that I'm working with They're like, oh, well, I need stories for all these different places in my book. So they believe at this point that they have stories, but then it's like, okay, I have to come up with a number of stories. And it's like, well, wait a minute, a good number of your stories are case studies. And they're like, oh, okay, I can do that. Right. So suddenly they have five stories that they didn't know they had because they pull five case studies and then they make just a little bit of a narrative around it. Around so it's that so. interpretation of the information. It's just a slightly different interpretation. Exactly, exactly, right. And disclaimer, it's not an interpretation of the results, right, of the outcomes, but it's in the creating the empathetic bridge between the outcome, the hero of the case study story, and the reader to connect those three together. Fascinating. I'm going to look at case studies completely Yay. differently now. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I think that when you start looking at words, I mean, it's a, again, different interpretation of what a word means. Now, for instance, I like the idea of talking about vignettes. And I know in my book, which is a niche is how to make it big in a small market. I've got little vignettes at the end of each chapter where I've got exactly, and I suppose it could be a case study. It's how one particular entrepreneur has done what I talked about in the chapter. Brilliant. Yes. A vignette case study. Perfect. It's yeah. probably, I don't know, 100 words, 150 Bril- max. Brilliant. In my first book, which is called Marketing with a Heart, what I would do throughout the chapters, I would take two pages per topic or you know per subtopic within the chapters, and I would write the left-hand page would be 
the informational stuff, right? The facts and, you know, the page length accommodated approximately 200 words. And on the right hand page, I would tell the story, do the case study of the thing I just taught on the left hand page. Perfect. It yeah, was, yeah, I love that. It was great. And it was a really easy way because I didn't have to suss out 1200 words of a concept, right? It was like 200, 200, 400 total. And it's like, okay, I can do that. And then I can move on to the next topic. Stuff like that also supports me because I, <laughs> being a, a creative entrepreneur, I bounce around a little bit as well. So the vignette approach, I also find supportive to my workflow process. Our listeners love learning about mistakes, especially ones that they need to avoid. What are a couple of big juicy mistakes that you see people make when it comes to storytelling? And we've addressed some of them already from your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody has stories. But from there, it's the that most of the time it behooves you to go deep into the raw truth and be as vulnerable as you can be in the story. Because the more vulnerable and raw you are, not all the time, all situations, not all stories, of course, but the more raw and vulnerable you can be, the more you're going to resonate with the person you're serving, you know, assuming that the story is resonant with that person, right? And if you're serving them and you know what they need and what kind of challenges that they have, then the stories that you're telling about yourself are wonderful mirrors and guides for this person, right? And you can affect a deeper transformation in yourself, in this person, and in the world, spiritually, quantum, physically, however you want to call that, all things are connected. The more you go to the truth and the more you really connect with who you are, why you're here, and express that unhesitatingly. Not to be shy about sharing. I know that for many years, I just didn't tell people about me or any flaws that I had. <laughs> didn't want to admit them. But now I'm like, okay, this is me. You're getting me. And uh, if you like it, that's great. If you don't, hey, that's your preference. Take exactly. it or leave it. Can we be too raw in what we're sharing? Probably. And I think the simple solution to that is to know your audience and know how to most effectively connect with them. And that whatever you're sharing and that you understand why you're sharing it. Like if you're going to be way raw, why are you being way raw, right? If you're going to be way not raw, like what is the reason behind not only the story you're choosing, but the way in which you are sharing it? So just the intention behind, just like everything else, our thoughts, our words, our actions are key to what's going to happen. And even when we're perfectly aligned and intentional and all that kind of stuff, somebody still might say it's too raw or whatever, and that's okay. And it's worth the risk to play full out in this context. And I think, you know, if you would boil down what you've just said, is really knowing your audience. I love talking about niche marketing, knowing your niche, knowing what would appeal to them versus what wouldn't, then I think that's very important to take into consideration when you're presenting that story, whether it's in written form or in a training program presenting as well. Exactly. Yeah. Several of my stories are around experiences of mine traveling and traveling is super relevant to my audience. My folks who are book writers are also very intentional and intending around, people call it different things, but basically to have full time and financial freedom so they can be creative, they can travel, they can have time with their family, and they can share their message every day unrestrictedly. Fabulous. Ben, if our listeners wanted to find out more about you and what's going on in Ben's life, how can they do that? The most exciting thing going on right now Susan, as you know, is my, my upcoming event, Publish Position and Profit. That's at publishpositionandprofit.com. And what I'm doing at that weekend is basically teaching people and helping people understand how to go from idea or half-finished manuscript or even a book to published and profitable and making an impact. 
And it's not just a weekend of a whole bunch of information, but we actually, I take you through building a customized roadmap for your best strategy for launching and doing it in a way that really, you know, supports your goals and your lifestyle, right? You don't have to do all the crazy launch things on one single day. Do everything in your business in a way that supports you and supports the people you serve. I'm teaching that stuff, June 18th, 19th, and 20th, publishpositionandprofit.com. And if you want to chat with me about that or anything else, because we got into so many wonderful places today, Susan, thank you very much. Feel free to just book some time with me at influencewithaheart.com slash chat. That's influencewithaheart.com slash chat, C-H-A-T. Fantastic. And I'll put that in the show notes as well, Ben, because sometimes our listeners are traveling and can't write anything down while they're listening. So you we'll keep, put keep that your hands the on the wheel. Absolutely. <laughs> Focus on what you're doing. <laughs> ben, if you could leave our listeners with a golden nugget, what would that be? The most important thing in the world to understand and practice is the difference between pain and suffering. And Pain is part of this life and suffering many, many times is optional, whether meditating, exercising, psychology, you know, whatever the things you need to do to help yourself understand that and practice that and stop taking pain personally, let it be a part of life. I mean, obviously take care of your pain, but don't take it personally and let yourself still be happy regardless of the quote unquote discomforts of life. Sounds like there's a story there. But oh, yes, I, we'll have to save that for another time. Ben, you've been amazing. I've loved having you as my guest. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for taking time out of your precious day to listen to this interview. And I sincerely hope that it sparks some ideas you can use to sell more books. Here's wishing you much book and author marketing success. The time is now to take action and finally build your book selling empire. And the great news is that Susan is here to help you. Visit bookmarketingmentors.com and sign up for a free 15 minute book marketing strategy session with Susan. She'll help you discover your first steps to marketing and selling your book. Only those who take action are rewarded, so visit bookmarketingmentors.com, and we'll see you again next week.